Very good afternoon, distinguished guests, honorable colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen. As the executive director of uh, the EU Center at Korean University, I feel extremely honored and prestigious, as well as pleased to welcome all of you to this uh, very important event, special lecture. The speaker we invited today is uh, His Excellency Brendan Harlin, who since 2011 has been serving the government of Ireland as the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. Minister Harlin is one of the most influential politicians and policymakers of Ireland. Together with the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, and the Minister for Finance, Minister Harlin participates in the Government's Economic Management Council, which deals with economic planning, budgetary matters, and the banking strategy for the Irish economy. Minister Howlin had assumed a number of uh, incrementally important positions, political and governmental positions, such as two minister positions for environment and health already in 1990s, and he also is a member of both Senate and Parliament, Labour Party spokesperson on European affairs, constitutional matters and law reform, and human rights. And finally, elected Deputy Speaker of the Irish House of Parliament on uh, 26 of June 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know well, Ireland shares with Korea a number of uh, characteristics. We are a small open economy and surrounded by big powers. Our development strategy largely was outward oriented, earning the nickname of a tiger. Korea as one of Asian tigers and Ireland the Celtic Celtic tiger. I think Minister Howlin's talk today is addressing this aspect as well. Namely, how Ireland has failed in the global financial crisis and Eurozone debt crisis. Considering Minister Howlin's portfolio of public expenditure and reform and his vast policy experiences in Irish government, we can expect hands-on experiences from most capable policymakers who fought for the country at the front line. Why don't welcome him with big hands? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Park, distinguished members of faculty of Korea University uh, and students of Korea University. Thank you for turning up uh, and let me explain why I'm here. This time of the year we celebrate our national day in Ireland, St. Patrick's Day. and. The St. Patrick's Day celebrations happen across the world and it provides an opportunity of members of the Irish government to reach out to world leaders and peoples to demonstrate the, value, the values that Ireland offers politically, economically and culturally. I'd like therefore to begin by saying how glad I am to have this opportunity to speak to you. I'm honored to be asked to one of Korea's, indeed one of Asia's most prestigious universities. I'm particularly pleased to be at this European Union Center, which I understand will shortly celebrate its first birthday. Happy birthday in advance. These centers play a vital role in ensuring that the economic and political ties between Europe and the rest of the world are strengthened. Through encouraging greater understanding of the European Union and of EU policies, not just here in Korea, but throughout the world, I firmly believe that these centers enhance Europe's resolve 
in addressing and challenging global challenges that face us all. Some of you may know that this is in fact my second visit to South Korea. Like the first time I arrived, I continue to be struck by the talent, the industriousness, and the vigor which is found here. What I want to talk to you about today focuses on two core themes. Ireland's recession and subsequent recovery, and the lessons which can be learned from Ireland's experience and what, can, uh, what from those experiences can be applied elsewhere. Ireland and its economy suffered more than most in the wake of the global financial crisis. International developments certainly contributed to the economic problems that became manifest from 2008 onwards. However, it was the pursuit of inappropriate domestic economic and fiscal policies in the years leading up to the crisis which caused us the greatest hardship. When my government came into office in 2011, we recognized that we were living and spending beyond our means and that a realignment had to take place. But on St. Patrick's Day, this particular week, in 2015, I can tell you that we've made remarkable progress and there has been a remarkable turnabout in Ireland's economic fortunes. Ireland's success in dealing with its challenges is all the more noteworthy as it has come on the back of hard work, sacrifice, improvements in our competitiveness and efficiencies. We know firsthand that difficult but necessary reforms which produce long-term economic benefits must be implemented. These reforms that we've put in place over the last four years are the bedrock of our economic recovery. Of course, the impact of the financial crisis extended across the globe. The challenges which we faced in Ireland, while severe, have unfortunately not been unique to Ireland. The European Union, specifically in the Eurozone, has had to grapple with the inadequacies of its government framework, that's the governance of the Euro, low levels of economic growth, and the threat ongoing of deflation and high levels of unemployment. I'll give you an overview of the reforms which the European Union and its member states have introduced in order to improve the formulation of fiscal policy. While significant progress has been made in improving the fiscal governance framework and the resolution of the sovereign debt crisis across the, periphery, uh, the peripheral countries, a number of issues still remain to be resolved. The rise in dissatisfaction among the peoples of Europe with some of the European institutions demonstrates that the benefits have not been fully realized or appreciated. Ireland has been among Europe's best performing economies throughout the 1990s. We had very high levels of economic growth, low unemployment, and consistent budget surpluses. It's the period that Professor Park referred to as the Celtic Tiger. What we've now come to understand, however, is that that growth in the years up to the financial crisis was based on a faulty and unsustainable model of domestic consumption. The beginning of the, the, the global credit crisis in 2008 coincided with a dramatic slowdown in the Irish economy. The problem which first emerged in the subprime lending market in the United States severely impacted on interbank lending and capital markets throughout the world. The Irish banking sector, which had benefited enormously from low borrowing costs, which the joining and establishment of the euro initially brought about, suddenly found itself no longer able to borrow um, on the international markets. However, we must acknowledge that Ireland's economic problems were, as I've said, largely homegrown. The overinvestment in domestic property was fueled by inappropriate economic and fiscal policies, which saw at the same time 
double-digit increases in public expenditure and simultaneous tax cuts. The almost overnight collapse in the construction industry in Ireland and the difficulties in the banking sector had a profound impact on our economy. Real economic output collapsed, falling by 9% between 2007 and 2010. The unemployment rate increased from a low of 5% to 15% in that same period, as 300,000 people lost their jobs. Due to losses in the property market, the banking sector required a bailout from the state of some 65 billion euros, a figure equivalent to a third of Ireland's total economic output last year. Of course, these developments had a hugely negative impact on Ireland's fiscal position and on the credibility of Ireland's public finances. Tax revenues fell by one third in the space of three years. When the cost of stabilizing the banking sector is included, the deficit in 2010 stood at 32.4% of GDP. That is a mind-numbingly high figure. These factors contributed to Ireland's inability then, in 2010, to raise finance on the open financial markets. Ultimately, Ireland was forced to seek financing from its European partners and from the International Monetary Fund. When the government that I'm privileged to be a member of came into office exactly four years ago in March of 2011, the scale of the challenges facing us was crystal clear. We understood that a necessary prerequisite for healthy and sustained economic growth is the sound management of public finances. Our strategy to return our country to economic prosperity had three fundamental pillars. Firstly, restoring the sustainability of public finances. In simple terms, balancing our books. Secondly, repairing the broken banking system. And thirdly, improving the economy's competitiveness through structural reform to, to drive job creation. With my colleague, the Minister of Finance, we developed an approach to fiscal consolidation to gradually reduce the deficit to below the target we set of 3% of GDP by this year, 2015. When you consider the starting point, the total deficit in 2010 in excess of 30% of GDP. Now, a, a chunk of that was the banking um, recapitalization, but even leaving that aside, it was of the order of 12%. So in four years, we set ourselves the target of reducing the deficit to below 3%. And I can report to you that the target we set for this year of 2.7% of GDP will be achieved. Some two thirds of this effort fell on public expenditure and was, was achieved through the implementation of key budgetary measures, including public sector pay cuts, cuts in the numbers of public servants generally, the postponement of capital investment projects, and driving administrative efficiencies across all agencies and departments of state. Between 2009 and 2014, public expenditure has been reduced by 9.1 billion euros, a reduction equivalent to 14.5% of GDP. Public expenditure contribution to the overall fiscal consolidation has been significant and ensured that our fiscal objectives were met. Our approach to fiscal consolidation was not to simply apply blanket reductions to all areas of public expenditure. In the context of a poorly performing economy and a weak labour market with ever more people unemployed, we recognised the need to support economic growth and protect society's most vulnerable. Our approach to economic and fiscal policy is based on maintaining an acceptable social standard, a safety net below which nobody should be allowed fall. Recent evidence uh, from the OECD and from our own research um, shows that Ireland's system of social transfers, and this is very significant, 
means that the means by which wealth and income are redistributed within society are among the most effective in Europe at reducing inequality and poverty. Our prioritization as a government has also accommodated the increasing de demands that the changed economic circumstances placed on our public services. For example, the number of people claiming unemployment benefit grew from 170,000 in 2007 to, to 360,000 by the end of last year. In 2014, we had 880,000 first and second level students. This is roughly 100,000 more than in 2007. So we've had to face demands in education and in health and in social welfare provision, and at the same time, reduce expenditure. Even in the face of these increased demands, we've successfully delivered on our fiscal targets every year, often with margins to spare. This year, 2015, represents the last year in which we will be required to meet a deficit target as we will now, this year, officially exit the excessive deficit procedure of the European Union. The deficit target that we've set ourselves this year, as I've said, is below 3% of GDP, a target that we will comfortably meet, and much larger economies within the Eurozone, for example, France, has sought a derogation because they will not be able to meet it. Our ability to follow through on our commitments to restore stability to the public finances ensured that Ireland became the first country to exit the EU IMF programme. We've regained again access to international bond markets, now at very favourable interest rates. International confidence in this government's ability to meet its liabilities have been restored. And Ireland's sovereign debt, which was not long ago regarded as junk, has regained investment status across all three of the international main rating agencies. This is hugely encouraging and further opens up Irish sovereign debt to foreign markets throughout the world, particularly here in Asia. Last month, the Irish government sold its first ever 30-year sovereign bond, amounting to one, 4 billion euro and a further 1 billion euro last week. It is significant to know that that 30-year money accrued um, an interest rate of 1.3%. Such long-term confidence in the Irish economy was unthinkable a few years ago. But we're now also in a position to repay the International Monetary Fund's portion of, the, uh, of their funding for us, of the bailout. We've already made two repayments in the last six months, amounting to 12.5 billion euro, and now less than half of the IMF's loan remained to be paid. This was a loan that was expected to, to be paid over 30 years. It will be fully paid back by the end of this year. Our success in putting the public finances right has been greatly assisted by my department's implementation of reform right across the public service. We published two public service reform plans beginning when we came into office in 2011. These have focused on openness, relentless efficiency, and focused on the users of public services in order to create better outcomes for them. The efficiency savings have clearly been important as we sought to reduce public expenditure. We've successfully created a smaller, more efficient public service with roughly 10% fewer employees. Equally important, however, was ensuring that the quality of public services provided was not negatively impacted by expenditure reductions. This required that we implement productivity improvements and other measures right across the public service as increasing demands, as I've indicated, have now to be met with less resources and less human capital. The latest public service reform plan, the second, which was published last year, focuses on the use of alternative models of service delivery, maximizing the use of digitalization and open data, utilization of the reform dividend to support service improvements, and greater openness, transparency, and accountability. Implementing this will help ensure that we continue to deliver ever better 
services to our citizens. The shortcomings of Ireland's budgetary process was fully ex exposed during the crisis. Reforming the budgetary process itself has also been an important priority for government as we seek to enhance the analytical capacity of government departments and provide the taxpayer with greater levels of information on how decisions are arrived at. We now carry out per periodic reviews of public expenditure, comprehensive reviews of expenditure as we call them, in order to determine where our priorities should lie into the future. The latest review was carried out last year and has informed public spending decisions for the next three years. We now publish performance information which links government spendings with outputs. In the past, Parliament focused almost exclusively on what the money was spent on. Now we want to see what did we get for the money, what was the outcome, and was the target outcome achieved. We've established the Irish Government Economic and Evaluation Service within my department, which has added immeasurably to our analytical capacity. The inadequacies of the previous fiscal governance framework at EU level has led to the most significant reforms in the budgetary process. I'll speak about those reforms later in the context of the remarks I want to make about the European Union. What I can say, however, is that these initiatives mean that Ireland is now approaching international best practice in terms of how we communicate our fiscal policies with our stakeholders. Achieving fiscal targets are well and good. Getting the numbers right on a balance sheet is important. But they're only one side of the coin. Over the past years, we've endeavoured to create the necessary conditions for economic growth. And clearly, this too has worked. Ireland became Europe's fastest growing economy last year, with official growth at GDP, of GDP of 4.8% last year. GNP growth was 5.2%. This is the strongest annual growth that we've experienced since 2007. We expect to maintain that performance this year and next year and into the future. It's imperative that the benefits of recovery are now felt by our citizens. There are encouraging signs that this too is happening. For example, the recovery in the labour market is providing more and more employment across all sectors. The Irish economy added 30,000 jobs last year, a clear indication that we're seeing a dividend from our changed, prioritised um, focus. We've completely transformed Ireland's labour uh, system um, with a number of initiatives through Pathways to Work, which helps the unemployed develop new skills uh, and reconnects them with market and job opportunities. Meanwhile, the reforms included an action plan for jobs. It is a joined up whole of government approach driven by every department to, to el eliminate any barriers there are to job creation. To date, the number of jobs created under the government's tenure has amounted to 115,000. While we can still work hard to deal with the ongoing unemployment situation, things are certainly moving in the right direction. We have a long and extremely successful track record in helping the world's leading and most innovative companies to establish themselves in Ireland. Even during the recession, our performance in this area has been robust. And as the global economy recovers, we expect to develop foreign direct investment even further. Last year, despite the concerns uh, around the euro and around Europe in general, or sorry, employment in the foreign direct investment sector reached 175,000 in Ireland, the highest on record. IDA, which is the agency responsible for attracting foreign direct investment into Ireland, sees no diminution in the demand uh, for investors to site themselves in Ireland and have targeted a further 35,000 jobs in the next two years in the, F uh, the FDI sector. In total, around 1,200 multinational companies have, have chosen Ireland as their strategic home. There are many reasons why companies continue to come to Ireland. Among them, we have a highly educated, adaptable and talented workforce. We have a highly competitive tax regime and we have a very pro-business culture and a government which has prioritised the removal of barriers to doing business. 
Ireland's indigenous companies are also recovering and are now leaders in sectors such as agri-foods and ICT. As the indigenous sector continues to work and work out the legacy issues affecting them after the recession, we expect strong levels of employment growth there too. So I'm greatly pleased to say that after years of contraction, growth has returned too to our domestic economy. So the benefits of taking difficult decisions, both with respect to fiscal policy and the implementation of structural reforms, are beginning clearly to emerge. Even with the high level of economic growth we're currently seeing, we're under no illusion regarding the work that yet remains to be done. We're certainly on the right path, but we're not yet out of the woods. Turning, as I said I would, to Europe, the outlook for the immediate future is less clear. Significant and welcome reform has been implemented in how member states formulate their own fiscal policies. These reforms have strengthened the provisions of the Stability and Growth Pact. They have allied the budgetary timetables of Euro area member states, so we all work on the same economic semester now. We've established a banking union and enhanced the oversight and enforcement capacities of the European Union over each domestic economy. In Ireland, we fully welcomed these reforms as we, un we understand more than most the impact of reckless profligacy and the dangers which such policies pose not only to our citizens but to citizens everywhere in the Eurozone. We've taken a very proactive stance in strengthening the legal frameworks in which decisions are made. For example, we've passed legislation which states that our budgets must be balanced or in surplus at all times. We've also introduced a multi-annual expenditure framework which allows us to better manage uh, and better plan expenditure. As I mentioned, we will deliver on our GDP target of below 3% this year, which means that Ireland will enter what's called the preventative arm uh, of the Stability and Growth Pact from next year onwards. We'll have to adhere to the fiscal rules within the protective arm, such as the expenditure benchmark and the adjustment towards the medium-term budgetary objective, the MTO. We will also have to make sustained progress in reducing our national debt to the target of 60% of GDP or below from its current level of 110% of GDP. Of course, the 110% is a little bit misleading because it includes very significant cash on hand in our National Treasury Management Agency, as well as uh, the, va the value of our shareholding in the banks, which we were, were required to nationalise. In real terms, the current debt is about 90% of GDP, which is not far from the European average. Thankfully, we've placed these fiscal metrics on a firmly downward tra trajectory. We remain committed to bringing the finances to a more sustainable uh, position in the medium term. And in parallel with these fiscal objectives, we must also recognise that the continued success of the European project, the project of the integration of the European member states, will be founded on ensuring that all European citizens see within the European Union the opportunity to prosper. There are serious challenges facing the European Union and we need comprehensive action from all member states to ensure that these challenges are addressed. While Ireland continues to strengthen, lack of demand in continental Europe has seen economic growth stall in many countries. We've also entered a prolonged period of low inflation and I just saw the European inflation figures published by Eurostat this morning, uh, and we're, all, we're still in negative inflation uh, of 0.3% negatively. More fundamentally, however, it is unacceptable that almost 12% of the Eurozone workforce is now unemployed, while in countries such as Spain and Greece, one in four of their citizens are out of work. This worsens when we look at youth unemployment, which stands across the Eurozone at close to 24%. The recent rise in anti-European sentiment across many member states is a direct consequence of our failure to tackle these problems, 
because these are the issues that matter to our citizens. Now that the more uh, existential challenges facing our common currency are abating, we must focus all our efforts on addressing challenges such as these. It is for these reasons that Ireland welcomed the more recent initiatives to help encourage growth. These include the European Central Bank's quantitative easing program, which started last week, and the debate around flexibility in the application of the fiscal rules. Now, if anybody wants to ask me a question about the fiscal rules of the European Union, I'll happily answer them, but your mind will get glaze over in, in their complexity. Providing the flexibility will in no way detract from the longer term goals of stable public finances, which we know we must have. Rather, allowing us some flexibilities to invest in key infrastructural need will bolster the long-term credibility of the fiscal frameworks as asymmetrical shocks will not prove to be insurmountable. Even with this greater flexibility, member states need to recognize that substantive reforms are required. The long-term prosperity of the European Union requires a competitive economy which can, can, stain, can, er, which can sustain the improved sta living standards of all our citizens. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that Europe is in uncertain times. After a period in which the Euro faced a real existential threat, which now thankfully is abated, new threats are emerging. The British referendum regarding EU membership and the rise of anti-European political parties right across the European continent do cause concerns. However, as a firm supporter for very many years of the European project and the ideals of an integrated Europe, I believe that we need to demonstrate that we are stronger together than we would be apart. In order to do this, we need to pursue policies which promote economic growth increase competitiveness in all our economies. Ireland, having taken difficult decisions regarding the size of its public sector and implementing key structural reforms, is now emerging from its challenging period. Its example shows that effective policies have the potential to be transformative and produce significant benefits. As our economy works through the remaining legacy effects of the re recession, we as a government will continue to reduce the fiscal deficit until we re reach balance. We will also be re refocusing our efforts on increasing the economy's potential output through continuing our programme of structural reforms. As my colleague on Taoiseach and De Kenny said last week, our ambition is to have full employment by 2018 and to have every job that we lost in the recession replaced by then. From the wider European perspective, there remains a number of challenges that I've indicated that need to be resolved. I've been saying for some time that we should not be focusing on austerity alone, but on a strategy for growth. I'm happy, therefore, that there is now a growing consensus that we must balance fiscal prudence with the need to promote economic growth and the flexibility of the fiscal rules which will assist this. It's imperative that we continue to move in that direction. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to address you on these matters. And I'd be honored and delighted to answer any questions that might arise.